Hello and welcome. I am Cyril Stober. Nigeria, like other countries, has continued to respond to the multisectoral issues thrown up by the novel coronavirus through numerous measures, massive enlightenment campaigns, stepping up testing capacity, increasing the number of care centers for those infected, a lockdown, promoting public and individual hygiene practices as well as non-pharmaceutical measures to stem the spread of COVID-19. Now, the federal government has also put out a number of palliative measures to mitigate the impact of the pandemic on citizens, especially the highly vulnerable. Today, our focus is on the palliatives and the organ of government concerned with alleviating the sufferings of citizens, not only affected by the ravages of COVID-19, but also those challenged by other crises and disasters. The Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development. Hajia Sadia Umar Farouk is the minister and she joins me on the program. Minister, thanks for being here. Thank you very much, Cyril, for having me. Right, it's, um, it's one year now. This ministry was created uh, in August. Uh, 2019 and so it's one year already so let's start off by looking at how it has been this past one year and how you have uh, managed the affairs of this minis ministry yes still it's been one year and it's like yesterday uh, I'm just realizing that time flies so fast mm. As you rightly said, it's one year ago that this ministry was created by His Excellency President Muhammad Buhari. Uh, so let me first of all uh, express our gratitude to Mr. President mm -hmm. uh, for establishing this Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development. And also to thank him immensely for finding me worthy uh, to entrust me with this uh, all-important uh, ministry. Uh, so far, uh, the one year of our existence uh, as a ministry has been both uh, challenging and rewarding. Uh, challenging in the sense that uh, being a new ministry and uh, the programs uh, were domiciled in other uh, MDs, Hitherto, now bringing them under one umbrella mm -hmm. for effective coordination and supervision. Uh, you have to put a lot of things in place to achieve that. And rewarding in the sense that when I visit the field and I see uh, people their emotions, their happiness by the uh, federal government intervention on how uh, we have responded uh, to their plights gives me really uh, a sense of fulfillment that at least we are serving humanity. So it has been a kind of mixed feeling and I would say uh, we thank God uh, for that. All right, challenging you say, but um, in fact, no one could have imagined that um, uh, shortly after the creation of this ministry, you would have to deal with one of the most challenging issues and not just um, a local issue this time around. It's a, a global matter that you have to Thanks. deal with. Now, here was the ministry tackling the issue of the Northeast, 
and all the displaced persons there, mm -hmm. and no one imagined that there would be something even bigger than that that would threaten uh, the entire globe. And that's talking about uh, COVID-19. So how did you how did you cope? You know, at the start of this pandemic, when when it came into this country, how how, how did you how did you manage to to rise to the challenge of COVID? Well, Nigeria, like any other country, uh, was really um, uh, challenged by this uh, pandemic. This is a global uh, health uh, emergency, and nobody expected it. Uh, it is termed a novel uh, disease. And so, also for the ministry, uh, because um, we are faced with other challenges, you know, as you rightly mentioned, the issue of displacement, the issues of disasters that occur every now and then. And then now we are faced with this uh, health emergency that has given uh, birth to a humanitarian uh, crisis as well. But uh, we say we give thanks to Almighty Allah because immediately this uh, pandemic was declared uh, a global health uh, issue, we realized what the consequences of that will be. And then with the uh, announcement of the lockdown, we know that uh, many people are going to also fall into the vulnerable groups uh, apart from the already and the ones that we already have. So Mr. President directed that the ministry should carry out certain uh, special interventions uh, to cushion the effect of this um, humanitarian uh, emergency. And we did that with the uh, full sense of responsibility. Uh, we took interventions to the states and also we, you know, uh, doubled some of our interventions, you know, especially in the areas of the social investment programs, specifically the JEEP program and the conditional cash transfer, which is uh, a normal routine you know, of, of, the, of the ministry, but Mr. President directed that we should give um, two months advance payment to these uh, poor and vulnerable households that have been given this conditional cash transfer, which we effectively carried out. And also on the JEEP, uh, you may recall that it's a soft loan given to our smallholder business holders, I mean, small business holders, trader money, market uh, people, as well as the farmer, small farmers. Uh, which we also gave them three months moratorium on, on the loan. So that we've done, we've taken food relief uh, to the states. We are giving also uh, some food uh, donations from the Nigerian Customs Service, which we deliver to all the states of the Federation for onward distribution to the poor and the vulnerable. We took interventions to the communities of persons living with disabilities, to the communities of the aged, and also some orphanages. Uh, so I will say we have uh, effectively done that. And uh, we have also, um, Mr. President also directed that we should continue to feed the school uh, children, even though they are at home. That is a very uh, <laughs> hot uh, topic, you know, right. uh, you know so, when we started that. Well, and that we have also okay. effectively carried out in the three states of Lagos, Ogun, and FCT. Okay. Well, Yes, you rose to the occasion, but um, certainly uh, not without uh, some very difficult moments. And I'd like to take a few of these um, measures and see how you developed that. And some, of course, became quite controversial in, in the public space, particularly the question of uh, the modified homegrown school feeding. Mm. Here was this pandemic. Uh, the government was forced to 
imposed a lockdown in some parts of the country initially. Mm. And of course, schools were closed. So people asked the question, how was it going to be possible to continue with the school feeding program? Would there be anything to show that it's done in a transparent and accountable manner? And that was one of the questions uh, people kept asking. Uh, and some, of course, skeptics didn't believe that it could be done. So tell us, how did you go about carrying this mandate out? Uh, well, uh, Cyril, let me first of all say that uh, that intervention was a directive by His Excellency President Muhammad Buhari that we should work with the state governments mm -hmm. to come up with uh, the best option mm -hmm. on how to feed these children even while schools were closed. Uh, don't forget the objectives uh, of, of feeding government feeding primary school pupils. Mm -hmm. One is to increase enrollment. Two is to uh, improve the nutrition of these children at that age. And three is to also improve uh, uh, the local economy mm -hmm. of these communities. So it's a whole value chain um, intervention by way of supporting the cooks, you know, you know to earn livelihoods as well as the uh, small farmers that provide these uh, food crops uh, to these, to these uh, cooks. So now we're faced with this uh, issue of, you know, children are at home while they were supposed to be in school. Yeah. And then Mr. President, in his wisdom, felt that we should continue to feed them. So we had uh, consultations and discussions with the Nigerian Governors Forum, and uh, we adopted that model of the take-home food ration okay. to these uh, children. We used the best um, data at our disposal. We also used the uh, criteria uh, for families and uh, the NBS and the World Bank have uh, given uh, that uh, a family, an average family should have at least six members in that family. Uh, the parents and then four children. So now we decided to take in between. We took for each household where these uh, children come from. Let's assume there are three of them that go to school. From five years to nine years, mm -hmm. you know. So that was what the criteria we used mm -hmm. uh, by providing this food ration. Ordinarily, every child that is fed by the government is being fed uh, with 70 naira. Okay. of meal, 17 naira worth of meal per day. Okay. So if you multiply 17 naira by 20 days, mm -hmm. that are supposed to be school days, you know, okay. if you, right. you know, extract the weekends, it comes to about 1,400 naira. If you times that by three children, it comes to about 4,000. Mm -hmm. 200 or there about. So this is what we came up with to feed, uh, to buy food worth this amount of money per month for these children to their households because every child has a household right. and every child lives within a community. You identify these households using their school registers, because for every child that is registered in a school, you must have the address of the house he comes from. You also must have at least a contact mm -hmm. of either his parent or his guardians. This we did together with the state uh, basic education uh, commissions, you know, super. Okay. So this is what we did, and we're able to do that. 
For transparency and accountability, we have engaged the services of uh, government uh, anti-corruption agencies right. to be part of this, uh, uh, these interventions. We have engaged the services of DSS, ICPC, EFCC. We have also engaged NGOs and CSOs to be part of it. We have engaged the services of the World Food Programme who are our technical you know, support to this program. And my view, Cyril, is not only Nigeria that has, has done this. Mm -hmm. Currently, UK gives 15 pounds of voucher, food voucher, to indigent uh, school children. Uh, Liberia does the same, and other countries of the world during this uh, pandemic. So it's not something that is uh, not obtainable. Of course it is. And this is how we went about it. And as I mentioned earlier, we started the pilot programs with FCT, Lagos, then Ugun. Mm -hmm. And so far, we have recorded uh, a lot of successes. For FCT, there were gaps because it was the first time right. we were doing it. We had challenges, but we, you know, made up for those challenges subs in the subsequent uh, uh, states. And you need to see the testimonies of these uh, parents and even the children that are being fed, you know, uh, with, with this, with this, with this uh, intervention. They're very happy and they feel, you know, a sense of belonging. So there's transparency, there's accountability, this is, uh, we're given directives, and we carried out these directives to the best of our ability. Uh, something related to that is, people look at it and say, is this sustainable? How long can this go on? Because schools are still short, except for those um, that are, you know, writing examinations and they are in exit classes. Mm. The schools remain closed. And this process will continue. Well, we didn't, we didn't uh, anticipate this. We, nobody thought this was going to happen. And uh, we thought even after the lockdown that at least uh, things will ease up and schools will resume. But here we are, still schools are locked down. But this is a period that is, uh, they're supposed to be ordinarily under normal circumstances. Schools are supposed to have been closed right. for the long vacation. So we are, we, are, we are taking that because children are supposed to be at home originally, okay. not for, because of the pandemic or because okay. there's lockdown. Now, you know, there's no lockdown anywhere. Right. Are, the, the things have eased up, you okay. know. So, so, so for now, okay. you, you know, you had to suspend we, that have, we have suspended it. Now, yeah. if by any chance the period within which people are to be at home mm. for normal holidays mm. expires, would you still revert to this? We will continue. We will continue. And as long as Mr. President gives us go ahead, we will. All right. We will return to the issue of the uh, homegrown school feeding. But beyond the children, uh, quite a number of families and households we are seriously hit by this pandemic and the lockdown as well. Um, people could not go out and uh, uh, there were so many vulnerable people especially those who depended on a daily economy yeah, yeah. and so how did you reconcile that because you have a register of uh, vulnerable people but with this pandemic that more than doubled or even trebled well i uh, think you can only do your best honestly um uh like I said, nobody anticipated this, but we have to make uh, emergency provisions for this kind of eventualities. Now we have a register. That register is for uh, poor and vulnerable households. Mm -hmm. But because of this pandemic, people have become poor, especially the urban poor, people who really rely on a daily wage to earn a living. Now, Mr. President, in his wisdom, also directed that we should uh, expand that social register by one million to also capture the urban poor. But it is a process. There has to be monetary provision for it because this is a new thing now. 
all like the home goal school feeding program already monies have okay. been provided have been budgeted for now that has to be captured into the economic sustainability committee chaired by his excellency the vice president before it was presented before council council approved now it has to be taken to national assembly the whole budget has to be taken to the national assembly we just got the approval early this month or so so now we are in the process of that rapid response you know targeting this urban poor using telecos and bvns of these people that have a bank account that's five thousand and below these are people who are identified uh, going by the poverty uh, right. index yes. as well as people who will charge their phones phones Thank between you. 100 naira and below this is the criteria for this urban poor now right. well, well we we are in the process we okay. have not started giving out this All intervention. Right. Uh, minister you know this uh, i brought this up because it's quite important and i would like to ask you what you feel when you see reports in the public space and particularly in uh, some media including uh, social and uh, the traditional media where people come out and say look we have not received anything i we thought the government said there was going to be palliatives nobody has given us anything you, we want you to explain that well uh you see I, I can understand people's um frustrations and concerns mm. and, and they are genuine but the fact is that <laughs> we cannot you know provide for every poor person in this country within this uh, period we're talking about almost a hundred million people considering the limited resources that even government has at its mm. disposal government is doing its best and uh, two things I always tell myself I am also guided by these two things two principles so to speak you know the principle of uh, my conscience and uh, that is serving God and then the principle of humanity which is service my passion to serve humanity I'm doing my best. It's suspected. But time will tell and history will judge us on what we have done. Well, you're not discouraged by things like that. I'm not. Are I'm you, not because you, the people I'm serving, when I see them each time, as I mentioned earlier, this time I visit the field, these testimonies, you know, really gives me satisfaction all right you think that uh, if only people took some time out to try to understand how the system works then uh, they might just be more sympathetic to what's happening I mean everyone comes out there and says look we want palliatives in fact everybody demands palliatives. they do they call me madam palliatives they say also but I always try to make them understand that this palliative is not meant for every Nigerian they are palliatives meant for the poor and the vulnerable all right uh, within our societies and even with that we're still battling with limited resources so we just appeal for understanding and patience and also prayers right. so that everybody will not need to have really palliatives from government all right well um we'll, we'll take we'll, we'll, we'll take a, a breather from the covid challenge at this point in time but we'll look at other aspects of uh, what your ministry has been doing and uh, in the line of uh, the social investment program and that too um, has come with uh, its own challenges as well particularly the yeah. question of the end power and that's what we want you to address now payment challenge the beneficiaries the duration and the fact that uh, we're talking about a batch a and b and there's so much talk about C. Let's begin from. Yes, the Empower like program, yes. I can understand, has mm. dominated the public um, domain. Mm. 
Uh, it's a program that government, uh, as part of the social investment programs that has come on board since 2016. It started with batch A of 200,000 and batch B of 300,000. The design of the program is that uh, they will be exited after 24 months. Mm -hmm. So it's a two-year program. Uh, when we came on board, uh, we realized that um, the batch A had, um, uh, uh, you know, exceeded their uh, uh, time of exit because of some exigencies. And so we tried to see how uh, we can, you know, uh, have an exit plan. For the batch B, they were due due last month mm -hmm. so they were on course and we need to enroll more beneficiaries because there are many waiting with over uh, 40 million youths mm -hmm. into the labor market you know every year it's quite a huge number uh, so i can understand those in the program you know they have these uh, fears of uh, uncertainty what is going to happen to them when they are exited but that is the design of the program and like I said we have to pave way for others uh, to come 24 months 24 months the batch A had ex they have been on the program for over 40 months so we exited them in June we have a transition plan for them in place we are we have reached out to some MDS as well as uh, the private sector to see how they can be absorbed going through some processes as well. But also, it is interesting to know that out of these 500,000 empire beneficiaries, about 109,000 of them have become entrepreneurs, meaning they are now economically self-reliant mm -hmm. they have their entrepreneurs they are even employers of labor some of them are even uh, our aggregators now in the national homegrown school freedom program so you can see uh, uh some people have taken full advantage of that government support and intervention you know to be able to be something and get something now we are in the batch C. In the batch C, we have just closed their portal. We have about 5.1 million applicants. Very soon, by next week, we are going to start the selection process, which is going to be observed by due diligence, all you qualified applicants will be enrolled into the program. And as we move on, we'll keep the public updated as well as the applicants themselves. Well, now I know we have issues yeah. with the payments. Okay. You know, when we came, these programs were transferred to the ministry, yes. They used to be under budget and national plan. Their payment processes between budget and national planning and the Office of the Accountant General of the Federation. We had gone through processes of transfer of the programs, taking over, understanding the programs. So in, during those periods, we had delays in payment. Because as a minister and a permanent secretary, we need to understand what we are you know, putting our signatures on. So we had the first issue of delayed payment. Mm -hmm. Now we also have the issues of delayed payment because of the payment platform that has been changed from Remitter to IPPI, to Tiffmis, which also took some delays. And we're still having these issues of reconciling even the figures 
the numbers with the Office of the Accountant General of the Federation. From our own point of view, we have signed off all payments of Empower beneficiaries. And I will say this and say it again. Except for the independent monitors that we, are, we just signed off their June payment now. But for Empower beneficiaries, batch A, we have signed off their payments. Now the issue is with Office of the Accountant General because they are going through some reconciliation. Some names have appeared in other payment platforms, which we have asked them to submit to us. We hope that before the end of this week, we'll be able to know the names of those people that are also, because automatically, if you are, if you are on GIFMIS um, platform, and you are getting payment from another source, it will block All you. Right. So this is so this is this is the issue. This is not the issue of the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs or the Minister of Ministerial Affairs or Humanitarian Affairs is not paying empower, not mm -hmm. at all. I don't think a file spends more than a day, more than twenty four hours on my desk. Mm -hmm. I have signed off, the permanent secretary has done his own. Now it is in the office of the act because they make the payments. All right. <laughs> they have the payment platforms. So this is where we are. But I want to assure the empower volunteers whose payment is being delayed because they are quite uh, not, they're not volunteers, they monitors. Right. They are they're very small number that before the end of this month we fin we we'll finish the payment of this All right. we effect their payments, okay. you know. Going so we have exited by A and B. Mm -hmm. Now, going now back we to are the going question into of the, next uh, the duration, um, you did say that um, <coughs> Batch A had done about 40 months. Precisely. Um, certainly, you learned one or two things about that. So, what are you putting in place to ensure that um, Batch C uh, does not end up having no, this No, we are kind putting of all measures in place because I know wh what I went through mm. because of this issue of exit. So, now, anyone that is going to be onboarded onto this program, will have to sign that he's going for the number of time or the specified period that we have decided. We will not add one day onto it. Okay. Yes. Now closely tied to this is the Jeep. I, I believe uh, the Government uh, Entrep Enterprise and Empowered. Entrepreneurship mm. Program. Mm. Yes, and the Government Enterprise and Empowerment Program is also one of the uh, social investment mm -hmm. programs that came on board 2016. Uh, this is a program uh, that provides soft loans to our traders, market uh, people, as well as uh, our smallholder farmers. We have about 2.1 million beneficiaries of this program, and they are given this long uh, loans uh, that ranges from 10,000, 50,000, and 300,000. I think for the traders it's 10,000, mm -hmm. for the market money it's 10, 50, and then is the farmers that's 300,000. So uh, this is also another empowerment program that supports this um, category of uh, people for them to, you know, engage in meaningful uh, businesses as well as to lift them out of poverty. So it's a laudable program and uh, the program was domiciled or was in collaboration with the Bank of Industry right. because they are the entity that can you know, give uh, credit facilities. So that was uh, why they have to be, uh, they were engaged or involved into the program. And I can tell you, we also have testimonies of people who have benefited from this program and they are doing well. Last time I was in Lagos during the COVID, we also did uh, another intervention by reaching out to other, you know, beneficiaries that were in the platform yet to be you know onboarded 
And you could see the joy and the happiness of these people who are determined to make a living. With one of these programs, people have talked about a review, and uh, you mentioned it yourself, Minister. Um, the conditional cash transfer, COVID <coughs> brought with it so many issues, and even that too was quite challenging. It wasn't just um, schools that were shut, banks were shut, and uh, there were lots and lots of people who couldn't access anything through the, the normal systems. Mm. So how did you carry on? Because that led to so many complaints too about the, 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 the conditional cash transfer. Yes, Cyril. <laughs> it came with a lot of uh, issues as well. <laughs> and I don't blame people because it is about the first time that people, some people even knew there was such a program. Mm. And so there was a lot of misconception, a lot of uh, misinformation, you know, and people thought that we were just there to give out money. Many people didn't think that this program had been in existence since 2016. And it's a program that's in very close collaboration with the World Bank. So when Mr. President directed that we should give two months advance payment, I can remember it was my first, about my first intervention during the lockdown. We had to carry out that directive. It is a program that had been there. Mm -hmm. If not for the COVID, maybe people wouldn't have known there was such a program even. I went to flag of the program in Kuali Area Council. And I can remember banks were not completely locked down after a while. You know, there was a period that banks were allowed to open up. I'm a member of the PTF on COVID-19. So we went to carry out that intervention and people saw the way we you know, gave out cash mm. to, this, uh, to these families. And there was a lot of, you know, uproars and all that. But that was what we met on ground. And it doesn't mean that there are no room, uh, no rooms for you know for improvement. Uh, what we are putting in place right now is to digitalize the process, end to end, to make sure that whoever is a beneficiary of this program is have uh, a bank account, All right. or at least a mobile, uh, you know phones that you can you know pay them into using the mobile agents this is what we're working on and we hope that by next year we'll be able to digitalize the whole process of this conditional cash transfer okay. what so are the that issues that there was will be accountability right. and transfer. okay that yeah. was one of the issues that was raised and um the matter of ensuring that where you're giving out cash you have safety nets in in, in place to ensure that um, the money was going to who it was meant to go to, and it was not just um, uh, money. Because uh, some just saw the system and said, look, the ministry is giving out free money to people that it has identified or to party faithful. Could you disabuse Nigerians' minds on that? That is, that is very, very untrue because um, this conditional cash transfer, apart from the issue of giving out cash, I think is one of the most structured programs mm. of the NC. Because it's a program that involves all the critical stakeholders. It's a program that uh, involves the communities, their leadership, as well as different leaderships of the community, as well as the, as the state governments. It's a federal government program, but the state government is fully involved into this program. Uh, communities come together to identify which household is poor and vulnerable. And that is what goes into the National Social Register. And uh, before you give out this money, it also, before you even, you know, agree that this family is supposed to be given this uh, support. About three or four groups 
within that community have to agree to that. So it's a well uh, structured, uh, you know, process, and it's transparent. Now, when it comes to the National Social Register, it also goes through another process before it goes into the National Beneficiary Register. It is from that National Beneficiary Register that we take out these beneficiaries to pay them this money. And for every uh, caregiver of a, of a household, they are mainly women. They are the ones that have been identified. If you see the way we do it, it's women we give, except for a very, uh, you know, uh, exceptional uh, situations or cases. So we give, we, they, are, they come with an ID. And you scan that ID, and it reflects onto the, uh, uh, the mobile, uh, whatever, that, that we're using to identify them. If it shows, yes, this is the person that we have in our system, like it says, it's, this is Cyril Stover. And from our own end, it will show Cyril Stover. That's the only time that we are given that support. It means now you are the one that is really in that beneficiary register. So it's, uh, it's a program that is for the poor and vulnerable households in our, in our societies. It has nothing to do with your political affiliation or religious background or tribal, you know, uh, uh, you know, affiliation. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very well uh, structured and uh, objective uh, program. It has nothing to do with all these allegations that I seen, but as I said earlier, time will tell. We're doing our best, and the people who are given this uh, intervention, so they are happy with us, they are happy with the government. Right. Well, there's hardly any uh, aspect of, um, of the mandate of this ministry that we would, we would uh, look at that we would not return to the issue of the global pandemic and how it has affected it because um, before COVID, you had so many things, you, um, your hands were full, uh, so to speak, with so many other mm. matters. The mm. um, uh, question of displaced people from the Northeast, mm. uh, people who had suffered a lot uh, owing to the banditry mm -hmm. in uh, parts of the country, and generally people mm. who are vulnerable and need assistance, and yeah. those of course who had been uh, uh, devastated by um, natural uh, uh, disasters. How did this pandemic affect how you reach out to these various segments and how you carried out um, uh, your work? Well, um, Cyril, it goes with work. Uh, we, we had to intervene. And I'm sure you must have seen us in different places. We still went ahead to carry out these interventions. For example, in the Northeast, uh, we had taken interventions even as regards to the uh, COVID interventions because we have built isolation centers in the camps. Mm -hmm. We have taken medical interventions through the Northeast Development Commission. We have provided operational vehicle vehicles to the military to support their activities in the Northeast. We have also um, provided food relief, you know, non-food relief. So we, we continued because <laughs> this is what we are created, we are, we are mandated to do. Uh, the, the mandate of the ministry is to formulate humanitarian policies, to provide effective coordination of humanitarian interventions, to ensure strategic disaster mitigation, preparedness and response, as well as to formulate and implement social protection uh, programs in the country. So work must continue, whether there's pandemic or no pandemic, because this uh, crisis are there or they will occur, or they had been in existence. And we have been effectively doing that in all parts of the country, either 
by way of responding to disasters when they occur, fire disasters, uh, flooding, you know, or even by way of these uh, uh, humanitarian interventions that we take, that are routine. We have agencies under the ministry that take uh, humanitarian interventions in the area of food relief to all the IDP camps, the official IDP camps, on a monthly basis, and that is the National Emergency Management Agency, and that we have been doing. You so know, <laughs> again, we'll come back to the issue of the pandemic. Yes, you have to carry on with your activities, but again, in carrying out your mandate, you have an eye on the advisory about, um, you know, uh, contacts, social contact, social distancing in this period. Now, how challenging is that? Because if you obviously have it's, to it's distribute It's really very relief. challenging, mm. you know, Cyril, it's really very challenging. As a member of the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19, I very much know the implications of not observing these protocols. Uh, so for us, wherever we're going, we have even carried out sensitization and awareness campaigns through our agencies on the COVID protocol, you know. But sometimes you just cannot help because uh, it's an attitudinal issue. You know, when you move to the States, you see as if they don't even know there is COVID. We try as much as possible to maintain the social distances and all the other uh, distancing and all the other protocols. But what is most important to, to this particular group of people is the intervention that we're bringing to them. Well, let, let, let's talk briefly about <coughs> um, uh, your partnership and uh, collaboration uh, with other bodies. I've seen that um, in this business of uh, uh, responding to humanitarian affairs, mm. you can hardly do this on your own. So what's the level of your collaboration? Then? Well, um, we take that very seriously, collaboration and partnership. Um, one of our key priority areas is on strategic partnerships, mm -hmm. and we've been trying to build on those uh, partnerships that are in existence and then to reach out to more. The UN body, for instance, they are our partners. Almost all the UN agencies, we are working with them under the umbrella of the United Nations uh, Resident um, Humanitarian Coordinator in the mm -hmm. country. Uh, we work with other development partners uh, within the country. We have uh, MDS that we are working with, we must work with. We are working with Ministry of Interior, especially on issues of our refugees, our stateless persons, trafficked persons, because they are in charge of exit and entry. Uh, we also work with Ministry of Foreign Affairs, with Ministry of Finance, Budget and National Planning, Ministry of Youth Development, Ministry of Women Affairs, Ministry of Education, because as it is now, we are partnering with Ministry of Education on the alternate school program, right. where we want to incorporate these uh, almagiris into the former, so to speak, sector of education by way of, um, you know, supporting the, the malams through our various interventions and then so that the children will be off the street right. and we, we support them to come. So it's one of those uh, uh, collaborations where we're where, where having with me. So you cannot do it alone. There must be mm. partnership, there must be collaboration. And we're doing that is one of our key priority, you know, area. Now, some look at the uh, Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs and, and, and say that there are so many key agencies which you supervise. And that's a daunting task because uh, people are wondering that one ministry has suddenly become a super ministry. And uh, there are quite a number of agencies that are... Uh, that you supervise. 
How is that task of supervision carried out? Uh, well, Cyril, let me first of all mention the number of agencies that we have in this ministry. Mm -hmm. We have four agencies and two programs. We have the National Emergency Management Agency. Mm -hmm. We have the National Commission for Refugees, Migrants, and A IDPs. We have the Northeast Development Commission. We have the uh, National Agency for the Prohibition of Trafficking in Persons, mm -hmm. NAPTIP. Then we have the SDGs and then the National Social Investment Programs. So there are six. And, this is a and huge, this, huge we have ministries, units, Cyril, yeah. that have uh, 40 something agencies, 30 something, 20 something. But the most important thing that we should look at uh, in this particular uh, matter is the issue of the interconnectivity of these right. agencies with the ministry. There are agencies that deal with humanitarian issues. They cannot be better in any other place than this Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs. And that is what the government saw and felt that all these humanitarian agencies and social development uh, programs should be under one umbrella for effective coordination and supervision. That is, that, that is the essence. They didn't bring any agency mm -hmm. under the Ministry of Petroleum or Ministry of uh, Works or Transport right. under this ministry. All these agencies are agencies that deal with humanitarian issues. They are interconnected. Uh, they, 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 they have uh, you know, similar roles to play. So it will, it will be in the best interest of government that these agencies are under a ministry that will supervise them, coordinate them, so that there will be synergy. There will be complementarity in their, uh, you know, uh, responsibilities, rather than you know, fighting each other. Okay. All this interagency rivalry. Now, when we have an issue that has to do with trafficking in persons, and we're supposed to evacuate people. I would just, you know, we'll talk, NAPTIB is on top of it. I will ask Nema, Nema, please support NAPTIB. And it is done. All right. So, so I, think, I think this is the best thing that can happen uh, to, to, to this country by creating a ministry that will coordinate these agencies. Right. Well, ministers will begin to wind down. Uh, it's been one year, and you say it's been a challenging one year. And I believe you can expect that the years ahead would be challenging, even more so, especially uh, in view of what's happening the world over. Uh, Post-COVID, uh, what are your projections? Because certainly you would find many more families will become vulnerable and many more would require support. What are your projections? Uh, let me say challenging and rewarding, as I mentioned right. earlier. It is rewarding uh, serving humanity. Um, but the challenges will will not be peculiar to this country alone. So we are working on building resilience around the social safety nets of our people for the future. And uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, programs that we are putting in place to see that we build the resilience of these vulnerable groups, you know, to equip them, you know, for, 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 for any future eventuality or for their future endeavors. This is at the front burner of our, our plans going forward post-COVID. Well, Minister, just before we round off, there's just this small matter which we would like you to clarify. Um, in our discussion so far, you've mentioned it, that um, it's not possible uh, for the government to dish out these palliatives to every single citizen. Uh, certainly not every uh, uh, single Nigerian citizen and not even every vulnerable group. But then quite recently there were stories, particularly in uh, the social media, that you said every family in this country had received palliatives. would like you to clarify if you actually said anything like that. Cyril, I didn't. It is a very impossible ambition for anybody to say or to even think that he can give palliatives to every Nigerian. 
what I said at that briefing, it was during the PTF briefing, and I have my briefing notes, was that I have delivered palliatives to every state of this country for onward distribution to the poor and the vulnerable. To every state, I have taken palliatives, except one state till today, if they want, their palliative is there. So for every state, as far as I'm concerned, we have taken palliatives for onward distribution to the poor and the vulnerable. This was what I said, but I was misquoted, you know, <laughs> and uh, I came back to clarify on the same platform that it's just humanly impossible for Nigeria to say that it can feed every Nigeria, or can give every Nigeria palliative. I don't think even our budget can accommodate that. So Ajia Sadia Umar Farouk, uh, Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development. It's been interesting talking to you. Uh, we're glad that you've come again to talk about these issues mm. and uh, we thank you for coming in one on one. Thank you so much, Cyril, for having mm. me and good to see you again. And uh, as we usually say these days, stay safe uh, as yes. you carry out your bandage. Thank you so much. Thank you. thank you. And that's our program today. We thank you for being with us. Next week we'll be back with One on One. I am Cyril Stover. Stay safe.